Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome listeners, you're with me, Megan O'Hara Sullivan, and we're on that segment we call Big Little Small Talk, which I've got a byline for now. Someone said I'm the chit chat champion, so I'll take that as it comes. Today, I have one of the region's well-known academics and professionals, Professor John T. Horner. Welcome to Big Little Small Talk. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. John T., we met only yesterday because we were at the Cobb & Co Museum and they have a travelling show called Australia in Space. It's from Questacon in Canberra. What is Australia's involvement in space? Well, it's a growing thing and we finally now, of course, got an Australian Space Agency in recognition of the great work that's really been going on here for decades, even though it's been flying under the radar a little bit. You can go all the way back to the dawn of the Space Age and right here in the region, up at Kubi, they had a listening station to help NASA in the very early days of spaceflight. We're talking the early 1960s here. So we've had a role on and off all the way through then. And more recently, of course, at UniSQ, We've developed this really, not just Australian leading, but world leading portfolio of different research that's going on. We've got our own stuff at the Centre of Astronomy where we're working with NASA and actually receiving money from NASA for our work as well. So we've got a direct connection there. And that's work in the astronomy sense, looking beyond our solar system to find planets around other stars. But we've also got incredible work going on in rocketry and also in hypersonics. We've got some of the world's leading researchers in essentially the physics of what happens when you bring a spacecraft back into the Earth's atmosphere at incredibly high speed. And we've got a tunnel at the uni that allows people to test little models of spacecraft in exactly those conditions, which is one of only a few in the world and means we have people from overseas bringing things to the region as little miniature versions of spacecraft to put in this tunnel and see what happens. Right. So when people say it's not rocket science, you say, well, it is actually... Well, is that right? Is that, is that how it goes? I'd almost say rocket science isn't rocket science in many ways. Because oh. you always give this impression that rocket science is rocket science because it's the hardest thing that you could ever do. I think no different to any other field of human endeavour in that if you're good at it, it's not as hard as everybody thinks. And I don't think necessarily people should be put off studying the physics and the maths and all the rest of it that underpins all this because it's hard. Because in actuality, I don't think it is if it's what you love. And I think a lot of people get put off at school because there's this general perception that maths is hard, maths is scary, physics is boring. And I don't think any of that's true with that caveat that it's not boring if you find something in it that's your passion. In just the same way that, you know, I'd find biology hard because it's not my passion, it's not the core of what I do. I'd find languages hard, but to other people that they're really easy because that's their passion. Mm, Well, that's true of everything in life, isn't it? But coming from someone who's an astrophysicist and an astrobiologist, well, I think it, you know, we all need to find the things that we're passionate about. You say that you're not very good at biology. I don't know how you can be an astrobiologist and not be good at biology. Well, astrobiology brings together lots and lots of different disciplines. So my training in biology finished at the age of 15 when I did my GCSEs in the UK, because then to go on further to study to become an astronomer, I could only do physics and chemistry and maths. So to some degree, the ceiling of my knowledge of biology It's the same as anybody who's a school leaver. But astrobiology is this science of the search for life beyond the earth. And it digs into the questions of where did we come from, are we alone? And to answer those questions, you can't just have biologists. You need astronomers as well. You need physicists as well and geophysicists, geologists. Every part of, again, human endeavour, every type of research has to come together because there are questions that can't be answered just by one discipline alone. Mm. And so as an astrobiologist... My contribution is not studying how cells work or studying how animals reproduce, but it's rather looking at the astronomical things that could make one planet more or less suitable for life, how the planets form, how the different things come that could cause extinctions or make a planet inhospitable. And that's just as big a part of the question. And so astrobiology is this really incredibly diverse and multidisciplinary field where people with a huge variety of expertise have to chime in to come towards an answer. Mm. Well, look, I want to talk to you about that search for aliens and that big three-word question, are we alone, a little bit later on. 
But I just want to go back to the story about um, about Kuby Dam and that, that space station there. So tell me about that. That was to do with the listening, our role in listening for when man landed on the moon. Is that right? It was on the build-up to that. So I should say I'm not a historian in this and I'm not as widely versed as potentially I could be because obviously you can tell by my accent I've not been in the region the whole of my life. I only moved here in 2014. But it's a very important and I think overlooked part of the space race and our contribution to it. Because if you are communicating with people or with satellites in orbit, unless they're really far from the Earth, you're only going to be able to see them from a limited part of the Earth's surface. And even if they're incredibly far from the Earth, like at the Moon, half of the Earth at any given time can't see them. So a simple rule of thumb here is if you can't see the Moon because it's below the horizon, the Moon can't see you, and therefore you can't communicate with the Moon. What that means is that for people in America, who want to communicate with their spacecraft, whether there are people on them or not, they need to have listening stations around the world so that when wherever the thing is in space is below their horizon, it's above the horizon for somewhere else. And of course, Australia is a country that has a deep friendship with America, a long history of collaboration. So it's an obvious place at our kind of longitude to put your listening stations to listen in. And that does continue to this very day. And in fact, um, the station down at Tidbinbilla near Canberra is part of the Deep Space Network that is still listening into all these spacecraft, not just American, but all spacecraft from all nations, as part of that global endeavour to listen to what we've put out into space and hear it talking back to us. Mm, I remember a little while ago, I think it might have been the announcement when USQ was given some funding for uh, space research, that, and they had um, some of the people who had worked at that Kubi listening station um, came and came out to USQ. That would be fascinating. It seems like a different era, a different time. It is, it? It's lovely that we still have the connection there and we do still have both at the Cobb and Co Museum where we were talking just yesterday but also up on Baker Street next to the uni. Memorials of that endeavour at Kuby Dam so many years ago. We've got a dish on Baker Street with the NASA logo on it that is a replica of what you would have found in 1962, 1963 if you'd been up at the demountables out at Kuby mm. looking into this kind of stuff. And we do still have connections to people who were around and involved at that time. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? So, John T, um, where there was yesterday there was a watch, there was a display with a watch that was wor- the same watch that was worn by uh, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith and, incredibly, Andy Thomas, the Australian astronaut who flew on the Discovery. Tell me, you told me yesterday that I said, oh, you'd think... Um, Kingsford Smith would have needed more than a watch to fly solo from England to Australia. And you said, oh, well, not really. So tell me that story. It, it's part of the shared heritage we've got of navigating by the sky and by the stars. And there's a famous story from the 1700s, which has been published as a book called Longitude, which was all about attempts to develop a sufficiently accurate timepiece to help you navigate in the globe. Because you can work out fairly easily from the stars and from the sun how far north or south you are on the Earth. It takes a little bit of observing, but our planet's a sphere, and sorry to anybody who's a flat Earth listening, but the truth is out there. Our planet's a sphere, and that means the further north you go, the higher in the sky the stars in the north become, and the lower in the sky the things in the south become, because you're going around the curve of our planet. And what that means is that with a certain amount of observation, you can figure out your latitude fairly easily. Um, it's a little bit easier than in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere because there's a bright star next to the North Pole in the sky that makes it more straightforward. And these are skills that uh, the traditional owners in Australia have been using for generations that the Polynesian Islanders used to great effect to be able to navigate and that pilots, I believe, still get trained in because if you're piloting an aircraft and the instruments go down, you've still got to be able to navigate. So my understanding is that people who are learning to be pilots still, to some degree, learn these very traditionally grounded skills. And so figuring out how far north or south you are is fairly manageable. You can figure it out from the sky. Figure out how far east or west you've travelled if you're on an ocean or if you're in the sky far from land is much more challenging. The way you can do it, though, is by looking at the time at which things rise and set. Because the sun is due north for us or due south if you're in the northern hemisphere at local midday. But the time of local midday varies by where you are on the globe. So when the sun's rising here, it'll be high in the sky elsewhere. What that means is that if you've got a clock that tells you the time as of London time, 
because of course all of this was starting in England, Greenwich Mean Time. You know exactly when the sun will rise and set on any given day from London. We can work this out and the length of the day varies, but you know exactly when it will rise and set. So you can have a table that tells you sunrise, sunset and midday on this day should be at this time if you were in London. And the further west or the further east you go, the more the actual time will differ from the time you'd expect because you're further around. Now, that's okay. You, that means that if you can measure when the sun rises or when it's at its highest in the sky and compare it to when you expected it to be, that gives you a measure of how, how far around the Earth you are, essentially. The problem is, if you don't have a good enough timepiece, you can't do that. And back in the 1700s, it was a challenge to make clocks that were accurate to a precision of one or two minutes a day. Never mind the challenge of having something like that on a boat on the ocean where things are swaying. And so there was a, a huge prize awarded for someone who could solve that problem. And it was eventually solved. And you get the concept that a sufficiently accurate timepiece becomes a very important piece of the puzzle for navigation. That's what helps you ensure that you can work out your location east or west. And so for someone like Kingsford Smith, traveling across the vast Pacific, flying from America to Brisbane, he can work out how far north or south he is by observing the world around him fairly easily. Working out how far east or west he is depends on that very good knowledge of time in order to set the location. And I think that's probably why if you look at ancient maps from earlier than like the 1600s, they have the north and south fairly well ascertained, but the east and west get squashed and squeezed because it becomes more of a matter of personal perspective rather than real measurement. What an interesting story. I don't know that I'd like to do it though, with, um, you know, just a, just a watch and... <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit like kids going out and being scouts and things like that. The young will probably enjoy it a lot more than you or I would <laughs> because it's still an adventure. So do you know the story of why Andy Thomas had the watch? I actually don't know that story. I mean, I can understand why he'd take it with him as something that is so pivotal to our aviation history. And to have that connection from 70 years ago, you needed this to fly across an ocean and now I can take it to space. So I can see why he'd want one, why it's an incredibly powerful symbol. But I don't actually know the story of how he had it in his possession or who gave it to him. Well, you and I will need to go back up to Cobb Co to see if we can uncover the mystery of how Andy Thomas ended up with that watch. Tell me who Vera Rubin is and her, sig her significance to astronomy and space. Vera, Vera Rubin is one of a number of incredibly gifted female astronomers of the previous century who in their lifetimes were perhaps not as fated as they should have been. And she's now been recognised for the great work that she did by the fact that they're constructing the Vera Rubin Observatory. And there's a growing kind of body of naming big observatories after people. Sometimes that's incredibly controversial, as we've seen with the story of the James Webb Space Telescope, that is so controversial that a number of scientific journals actually don't require you to spell out the name, and you just use the acronym without mentioning his well, name. Well, well, before we go on to Vera Rubin, tell me that story. I don't well, know about that. So that's raised huge controversy and ire among the astronomy community and wider community. James, NASA has had a number of missions now that have been named after astronaut administrators rather than scientists. And James Webb is one of those. He was someone who worked at NASA in the post-war years and helped to accomplish a lot in the build-up to kind of the space age. But he's very controversial because of his role in some of the witch hunts that went, out the, went on at the time into people of differing personal lifestyles and stuff, and particularly in, in this case, the treatment of homosexual people in NASA. And so he's a very polarising and challenging figure. And so having a telescope named after him at a time when we're trying to be much more aware of equity and diversity and trying to show our support for people of all backgrounds is a very controversial thing. And I think some of the more senior people at NASA have not covered themselves in glory in how they've managed it. And the most recent example being that they released a document detailing the reason that they're keeping the name despite all the protests. They released that on National LGBT Day, um, and it was not exactly well thought out. And there's been things like that that have gone on. Do we have a James Webb telescope in Australia? So James Webb is actually a space telescope, so it's probably at the minute the most high-profile thing in the world astronomically because it's such an incredible technological achievement. And the debate over the name and the challenges that have gone around that shouldn't detract from what is absolutely astonishing. I mean, it's a telescope with a mirror 
more than six and a half meters, like six and a half meters across the mirror. The telescope's huge, which is bigger than the telescope. It was bigger than the rocket it was launched in. So to make that happen, they had to turn it into an origami telescope that would self unfold and deploy, which meant that it went up, folded up into a little box in the rocket, maneuvered to where it is now, and then spent a few months opening up with 234 different individual points of absolute catastrophic failure. So if any of them had gone wrong, the telescope would have been dead. So people were terrified. And it's a real testament to the engineers involved that this worked perfectly. And for the mirror, you've got this mirror in multiple pieces that had to unfold six and a half meters across with multiple fragments that all had to line up to a precision smaller than the width of a human hair. That's the engineering challenge there. So. It's an incredible technological achievement. We'll hear a lot more about it, but it's not without controversy because of the naming. Which brings us back to the Vera Rubin Observatory. That is named after a great astronomer who did wonderful things that were not fully recognised, along with a number of other female astronomers in the last century. And there's a number of cases I can flag up as to how this wasn't as good as it is today, hopefully. Mm. Hopefully we're getting better. But the legacy there is that this incredible facility, which I think is... Probably the most exciting astronomical observatory that's currently been built on the planet is being named after her. And this telescope, which is not quite her legacy, she wasn't involved with it, but this telescope that's named after her will be surveying the entire night sky every week for years to come, will increase our knowledge of our solar system, where I'm particularly interested in, by more than a factor of 100. So where we now know a million asteroids, in a few years we'll know 100 million thanks to this telescope. Mm. It's going to be incredible and as a result will generate so big an amount of data that it's a technological challenge just to use the thing because it will make petabytes of data every year. Mm. It's absolutely insane. So I'll just remind the listeners that you're on 102.7 FM and we're in big little small talk and today we're talking to astrophysicist and astrobiologist Professor John T. Horner. Well, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? So you were saying about um, Vera Rubin. So has there been a lot of women astronomers over the years? Probably not oh, proportionately. They have. Now, it's a field that is male-dominated, and we're very aware of that, and it's more male-dominated the more senior you get. It's also historically quite a Caucasian field, from a very white colour palette, although that's changing. But through history, there have been a large number of female astronomers who've contributed remarkably and whose exploits are perhaps not as well recognised as they would have been if they were men. And in many cases, men took the credit for the discoveries that women made. I mean, the most famous example from the UK was um, Dame Jocelyn Bell-Bennell, who was an incredible scientist, still is, who during her PhD in 1972, I think it was, discovered the first pulsar. So it's a tiny little ember of a star left behind a, from a violent supernova explosion. You're talking about an object the size of Brisbane, but more massive than the sun, so it's a little bit crazy. She discovered the first one of these. Her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, took all the credit. He got the Nobel Prize. And it's only in the years later that she's gained the rightful recognition she's got. She's incredibly gracious about it and talks about how this wasn't really his fault and it was what the times were like. And, you know, she's now a dame and she's won prizes and she's donated more than a million million pounds. So that's nearly $2 million worth of money she was awarded in prizes later in life of this discovery to the furtherance of the role of women in astronomy. Mm. But there's many others, you know, you go back to the dawn of the 1900s and this was a time where women couldn't work in the field if they were married. Things like this, they couldn't do doctorates necessarily. And there was a team of female scientists at Harvard, I think, called the um, Harvard Computers or something like this. And apologies, I've got the terminology a little bit wrong there, but there were people like Henrietta Swan-Levitt who discovered the variability of a group of stars called CFID variables, which now underpin our ability to measure distance in the universe. Annie jump Kamen. So there are all these incredible female scientists. Going further back, one of the great heroes in the UK, from my point of view, is Caroline Herschel, who was the sister of William Herschel, who discovered Uranus. And she was a far more accomplished scientist than him, and she achieved far more. Mm. And in fact, I think she was the first woman to be a member of the Royal Society. Now, you say that um, in that woman's case, um, the fellow got all the, um, all the glory. At what point, though, could he have said, it, as it actually wasn't me, do you oh. think? Well, I mean, right, she said it was right a sign up, of the time. Right up front. I mean, at the end of the day, this was her discovery as a PhD student. And if one of my students that I'm working with makes a discovery, they're the lead author on the paper. And it's clear that they're the person who's done this and where the support mechanism, where the mentors, we've worked with them. Mm. And 
yes, I understand that times were different, but... It's only the 70s. It yeah, wasn't that it, long it's ago. It's not like it's that long ago. John T, you made reference to the fact that you're not a local and you say that John T is your nickname for Jonathan. Where did you grow up? Where did you spend your early years? So I'm from the north of England originally, from Yorkshire. I mean, I say that I've got the Aussie passport now, so I'm officially one of us despite the accent. But I grew up in, a, in the outskirts of a town called Wakefield in Yorkshire during the time of the miners' strikes and during the 1980s when the north of England was not particularly necessarily that well treated and when times were very hard there. Um, And I was just very lucky in that I discovered this passion for astronomy at a very young age and also had incredible support from my parents that allowed me to maintain that in a place where it's probably fair to say aspiration and certainly academic aspiration wasn't a thing that was viewed very well by the people who were around me, by my peers. So So I was lucky to get that support. Yeah, you make that reference to your parents. What sort of work were they doing? Um, Bits and pieces. In the case of my mum, she was doing what job she could find to be able to spend the time with me and then work when my dad was at home kind of thing. And certainly through my teenage years, she was working as a social worker with teenagers who were troubled and were in care and things like that. My dad was at that point working for the council, ha- um, helping with the computers for the schools. Um, so both nine, of them left school them, yeah. at kind of 14, 15 years old. It wasn't like they had gone deep into education. Although my mum has done courses since retiring, university courses to keep her mind active and to sort of more widely. Because we're now in this incredible time when you have this concept of lifelong learning, where you can go back and study even after you've retired. And I've worked with PhD students who didn't start their studies until after they reached retirement age, left their careers and decided they wanted to go back and try something new. Mm. No one's going back and doing a PhD in accounting though, are they? They're all doing um, the archaeology and um, social work and interesting things like that, a bit more of the humanities, do you think? I I think people follow their passion and that's really important. But it wouldn't surprise me if people older in life are coming back and doing PhDs in accounting because some people would find that fascinating. (laughs) And And it's like anything else and I think... It is really important that all areas of interest are valued and it's really good that people can come back and do this, even if it's something that, you know, will get laughed at in a a comedy show. There's nothing wrong with being interested in something that's a little bit off the wall. So I read somewhere that you uh, started lecturing yourself when you were about eight or (laughs) ten years old, but take me back to the time, can you remember when you first started to fall in love with what was out in space? Yeah, I was just five years old, and it was simply that we'd caught a bit of a TV programme called The Sky at Night, and I was just hooked from that. And that was a regular show in the UK until the death of the presenters of Patrick Moore. It was a programme with the single longest-running heritage and history of a single presenter. So it first aired in 1957, long before I was born, and he continued presenting it up to his death probably about ten years ago now. And it still continues, albeit with different presenters. And it's 20 minutes of this is cool things happening on In the Sky this month and here's someone to talk about some new research. And it just got me hooked. And ever since then, I've been fascinated. So what happened? You asked your parents, can you buy me a telescope? Yes. Or I, I did get a telescope at one point and then we got rid of the telescope when um, an industrial estate was built behind the house and the light pollution got unbearable. And then I got my first computer. So it was swings and roundabouts. But I think a really fundamental part of the story for me was that at about the age of eight, I joined my local astronomy society with the help and support of my dad. And I think it, the one that we joined was because one of the people he worked with that he knew from work was already a member and said, oh, I'll bring him along. And it was brilliant. It, again, incredibly male-dominated and mainly incredibly older male-dominated as well. I mean, I think the average age was probably of retirement age and older because that's when people have the time to explore their hobbies. But it was brilliant. And I, It was such a supportive thing to share a hobby with people who share that same hobby. Um, And it was everything from spot welders to miners to detectives and all the rest of it, all going along and sharing this hobby. Once a month, somebody from one of the local universities would come and tell us about their research. And of course, not all great researchers are great communicators. So I learned a lot without really knowing I was learning that about what makes a good communicator, what makes a bad communicator. It was just really valuable and really helped me keep that interest particularly through my teenage years when there was certainly none of that support from a peer group at school or anything like that. Mm. I want to talk to you in a little bit about your um, 
your passion for communicating your love of astronomy, but just go back to um, you and your dad once a month, you'd go off. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful bond for you. Did you, did you have fabulous. any brothers and sisters? No, I am an only child and we'd go every week. It was just once a month we'd get a guest oh. speaker. The other weeks it was members of the society giving talks and that's where I obviously got started. You know, people would give a talk on what they were interested in and put some slides together in a slide carousel and run it through the clicky-clicky of the slideshow and all the rest of it. And it was lovely. And I think, look, as a kid, you don't really think, this is a great bonding opportunity, and isn't it? Wonderful. But I think my dad really treasured it. And obviously I had a great time and it was wonderful to get that experience and go every week. And we'd always stop for fish and chips on the way home. And, you know, obviously it was quite late night as a young kid. We didn't get home until quarter to ten at night which when you're eight or nine or ten years old is staying up late and with school the next day. So, no, it was fabulous. Yeah. And did, you, um, did your father get a bit sick of it after a while and you had to sort of make him still take you because you had no way of getting there? Or? Not really. And I think it's one of those things where when you've got someone in your family who's got a real passion, you kind of almost acquire it yourself. And I'm seeing the same the other way around. My parents have moved out from the UK and have now joined me here in Australia. And my mum in particular is mad on the bird watching side of things. And so me and my dad go for walks with her, take her around places. And I've got quite into getting a big lens and taking photos of the birds for her. So you kind of pick up people's hobbies and interests and share them with them just naturally is how we interact as human beings. <laughs> and I think he really picked it up and both him and my mum quite enjoy it themselves anyway now. Yes. Well, I wish I was picking up something a bit more intellectual than watching shows like Your Mum, My Dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, bird watching might be good. But um, So I wanted to ask you about this sort of passion for communicating. Um, my sister's just recently started working for the World Science Festival in Brisbane yes. and she talks about Dr Robert Bell who's the science communicator who works. I'm not sure whether you're familiar yeah, with him. Right. And she said his his way of communicating science and teaching a message is it's a skill it's like being a good waitress or being a good mechanic or being a good anything so why has it been so important for you is it is it because you can ignite that love in someone else to some degree I've been doing it since I was so young that when I started doing it it was just because I enjoyed it and so there was never any deep and meaningful thought went into it in terms of I want to develop this skill in order to do whatever it's just something I've always done and I've always enjoyed but that said, I think it is easy to justify it from the point of view of inspiring the next generation and getting people interested in what we're doing. That's a really important thing. So I think while I do it because I love it, and I, if, you, if you have something you're really passionate about, it, you always want to share it. And it's like my friends telling me about a new band they like or people talking about the favourite sports team. We want to talk about the things we love. And I'm just looking that I started doing it when I was young enough to learn to do it relatively well and to do it without much in the way of self-consciousness. And I say this in a very different way with a very different amount from the university, Callista, who is an incredibly gifted opera singer. And she's actually the artistic director for the Toowoomba Philharmonic Society. And she can just drop of a hat, she can sing in a room because she's been doing it all her life and she loves doing it. Whereas for those of us who start doing that later in life, that's really daunting. Um, whereas for me, the science communication, the giving a talk, standing up in front of a few hundred people and just talking without a script, it's fine because I've been doing it since I was really young. Now. Who doesn't want to talk about their hobby? <laughs> it's a win-win, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And do you see that, um, particularly with your students, do you see that moment where they get it or they've discovered something themselves and, and that's that joy of, of talking about it? with oh. people who, who share that joy. Absolutely. And not Takes everybody... you right back to that room in um, wherever it was. Yeah. Absolutely. But it, it's not for everybody. Not everybody's a good communicator. Not everybody gets a buzz from talking to the media or, or enjoys that side of their work. And one of the things I try to do with the students I work with at the PhD student level is to ensure they get the opportunity to try it so they can see if it's right for them or not. Because if you're not good at it, then you won't enjoy it. But if you don't enjoy it, you won't be good at it. And it's important to find that out because we're all skilled in different ways. And the way to have the most fulfilling career for these people is to find the things that they enjoy and the things that they're good at so they can follow them. And for some of them, that's absolutely science communication. For others, they prefer to be doing the science in the background and let other people talk about it while they just get on and do it. And both of those things are absolutely fine. But if you don't get the opportunity, you never know if it is for you or not. Yes, for sure. 
I'll just remind the listeners that they're with me, Megan O'Hara Sullivan, on Big Little Small Talk on 102.7 FM. We're talking to John T. Horner, who is a astrophysicist and an astrobiologist and an astronomer and a science communicator. And stop me now, otherwise we'll run out of time. John T., just recently we've had a blood moon. What is a blood moon? Blood moon is something that's just really nice because you can see it with the unaided eye and everybody can get together and enjoy it. And we've now got a bit of time to wait until the next good one, unfortunately. There'll be another couple of them in 2025, but they're not very good. The next good one in the evening sky is in 2026. And it's an occasion where the full moon, over the course of a few hours, turns blood red or very orangey or very pinky, depending on which one you see, varies from one time to the next and then returns to normal again. And what's actually happening there is that when the moon's going around the Earth, they're actually going around each other. But we say the moon goes around the Earth because it's simpler. The moon goes around the Earth, and every month it passes between the Earth and the Sun, and then two weeks later it passes so that the Earth is between the moon and the Sun. And you'd think, well, they'll line up. Shouldn't the moon block the Sun out, or shouldn't the moon go into the Earth's shadow? And normally those things don't happen because the moon's path around the Earth is silted. So normally when it passes between us and the sun, it passes above the sun in the sky or below it, and they don't line up perfectly. And similarly, when it's full moon, normally it's above the Earth's shadow or below the Earth's shadow, so it doesn't line up perfectly. But every now and again, you get things lining up just right when it's passing from above to below at the same time it passes through where the shadow is. And so from the point of view of the moon, the Earth gets in the way and blocks out the sun. Now, if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere at all, what you'd actually see is a vanishing moon, and the moon would disappear entirely, because we see the moon by reflected sunlight. And if the Earth blocks out the light from the sun, the moon would disappear. But the Earth does have an atmosphere, and that's good because we get to breathe it and we don't all die. So, I mean, I'm quite happy about that. (laughs) But what that means from the point of view of the moon is, if you were on the moon looking past the Earth towards the sun, you'd see the Earth move in front of the sun and block the sun out. But you'd see the Earth's atmosphere ringing, limbing that globe in space. And you'd see some sunlight bent through the atmosphere of the Earth, refracted, just the same way that light bends when it enters a swimming pool and makes it so hard to judge the depth of the swimming pool, the same physics. Light bent through the Earth's atmosphere to land on the Moon. And so when the Moon is in this total eclipse, it's illuminated by light from the Sun that has passed through the Earth's atmosphere. Why is it red? Well, it's red because when light passes through the Earth's atmosphere, blue light and yellow light get very effectively scattered away, leaving only the red light left. And it's the same reason that the sunset is red. The sun looks red at sunset because the blue and the yellow light get filtered out, leaving only the red light. It's also the reason the sky is blue, because when you see the blue sky, you're seeing that blue light from the sun that's getting bounced around and scattered away from all directions. That's why we get the blue sky. What that means from the moon's point of view, though, is looking at the Earth, the moon is surround. sorry, looking at the Earth, the Earth is surrounded by essentially a ring of fire at that time. You see this beautiful red ring around the dark body of the Earth, where the light from all of the dawns and all of the dusks around the Earth at that same time are bent through the atmosphere to fall on the moon, and that's why the light's red. So the moon is lit up by light from the sun that's passed through the Earth's atmosphere that has been filtered and changed by the Earth's atmosphere so that you only get the red light there, which is why the moon goes a dull red, and is really spectacular. It's all just a consequence of the physics that we kind of get in the everyday. We're used to all of the parts of that story. It's just piecing it together that explains a weird phenomenon. But it also ties into the work we're doing here at UniSQ and also around the world trying to understand the atmospheres of planets around stars other than the sun. And there was a big announcement just this week about data from the James Webb Space Telescope studying the atmosphere of a planet around a distant star and for the first time finding evidence of photochemistry and finding evidence of compounds that have never been detected in the atmosphere of a planet around another star before. The way that worked is exactly the same as that lunar eclipse. You have the planet passing between us and its host star, going across the disk of the star, and some of the light from that star passing through the planet's atmosphere and getting muddied up in just the same way that the sun's light gets muddied up passing through the Earth's atmosphere. And that imprints chemical fingerprints of every different type of gas you have in that atmosphere gives its own unique signal. Mm. And with a good enough telescope like James Webb, we can see that. So when you see these stories about us discovering different atoms and different compounds in the atmospheres of planets around other stars, you can think back to the blood moon and you can think about the fact that the science is essentially the same. 
Just don't ask me to repeat it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> now, this might be dumbing things down a bit, but tell me, are the flags planted by the astronauts still standing on the moon? They should be, with the one caveat that if something's hit them, they would probably get knocked over. So there's no real atmosphere on the moon. There's nothing really to blow the flags around. There are no gales to blow them and knock them over. But the flip side of there being no atmosphere on the moon is that things that on the Earth will just burn up harmlessly overhead and not make it to the ground will bombard the moon all the time. And if you go out on any night of the year that it's clear, you'll see meteors, you'll see shooting stars. And these are bits of dust and debris left behind by comets and asteroids whizzing around the solar system. And in fact, in a couple of weeks' time, we get the Geminid meteor shower, which is the best one of the year. And on the evening of the 14th of December, you can get a natural firework display by just going out and sitting out and watching the night sky. What sort of really, time are we talking about? Any time after 9pm there. So the later in the night you go, the better. With the caveat that this year the moonrise will be about 11.30pm. And once the moon's up, the fainter meteors won't be visible because they'll be lost in the glare. But the later in the evening you go after 9pm, the better the show will be. So any time between 9 and 11, is it? 9, no? and, 9 and probably... 9 o'clock and midnight would be a good time to look. The best time to look if the moon wasn't there would actually be between about midnight and 4 a.m. But with the moonlight, you can bring that earlier and you can look when the show's not quite as good, but the moon isn't interfering, mm. essentially. Mm. What that means for the flags on the moon, though, is that the moon is continually bombarded and on the Earth, it's only the big bits that make it to the ground and they're fairly infrequent. On the moon, even the little bits make it to the ground. So there is a chance that some of the flags will have been hit by little bits of debris and if a big enough one hit it, Maybe it could knock it over. Mm. But, but are, all, they not, um, are they not visible? Are they not photographed? Or? They're such a long way away and so small. Mm. So the average distance to the moon is 384,000 kilometres. And that varies by about 10% as the moon goes around the Earth in its orbit. These flags aren't that big. And so trying to get a picture of them from the Earth is essentially like trying to get a picture of a dust grain on an aircraft flying overhead. It's really challenging. The wider scale of things, we do have some data coming back from the places the astronauts landed. And that's one of the most outstanding bits of evidence that the moon landings definitely did happen. I mean, they definitely did happen. But one of the things that the astronauts did was to leave retro reflectors on the surface of the moon, which were essentially the same as the reflectors you have on your bike. Familiar with these very cleverly designed little things that whatever direction you have them, and if you shine a light on them, the light will come back to you. Clever design. They put those on the moon so that we could shine lasers at the moon and bounce them back to measure the distance. And we use them, we still use them today, to measure the distance between the Earth and the moon because that distance is very slowly increasing as a result of the tides that the moon raises that we feel here on Earth. An end result of that is that the moon is moving away very, very slowly. But we measure that using the things left behind by the astronauts who visited the moon. So... Yeah, right. That yeah. is incredible. I didn't know that. I've never heard that before. In a little minute, I want to ask you about Mount Kent, which is part of UniSQ yes. um, out near Nobby. The work that Elon Musk is doing, I know this is sort of, you know, popular culture and all of that. What do you think about that? It's one of those really interesting things which, I mean, you could turn this into a discussion of literature as well. You quite often see people portrayed as one of two things. They're either the saviour or they're the devil. They're always polarising. They're only good or they're only evil. And I think the work that Elon Musk's companies are doing are actually much more human than that in that they're both. They do things that are greatly beneficial to society but also things that cause problems. And we've seen huge benefits over the last decade or two because of the work of SpaceX in bringing commercial launch capacity, the ability to commercially launch things to space rather than it just being the provenance of NASA and the European Space Agency. And what that's done is it's catastrophically cut the cost of launching something to space by an immense amount. The cost of launching a kilo of material to space now is 10 to 100 times cheaper than it was a decade ago. And that's an incredibly kind of democratising thing because it means people who could not previously launch things to space now can. And the end result of that, in the wonderful end of things, is that high school students design experiments that get taken to the International Space Station. We've got kids in Melbourne who designed their own experiments. They got put on a rocket, they went to the space station and came back. And that was utterly unthinkable when I was a kid at school, just 25 years ago, you know. So there's huge revolution there. The flip side is that the use of the space around the Earth is not regulated. It's a bit like the Wild West, because global regulation just hasn't kept up with the use. And in fact, 
the use of space is still governed by the Space Treaty of 1967, at which time there were only two or three people, countries worldwide, launching, and you're launching two or three things a year. So with SpaceX launching the Starlink constellation of satellites, with the plan to launch 42,000 of these things in the next five years, there's no regulatory body stopping them. And they don't have to answer to anybody. And the problem is that those satellites are in the way and they obscure our view of the space beyond. And there's a lot of aspects of this that are very problematic and troubling to people and different groups of people raise different problems. So the traditional owners here in Australia, but also the traditional owners of the lands all across the globe, have a deep and intimate connection with the night sky. It's very important culturally. It encodes a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. And that night sky has been fundamentally altered without their consent and without any discussion with them. So they have obvious concerns, you know. At the same time, for astronomers, we're building things like the Vera Rubin Observatory spoke about. That is going to be hugely handicapped by these spacecraft. So you've got a multi-billion dollar facility that will not be rendered useless, but will be much less effective. And where it concerns me in particular is that instruments like Vera Rubin, one of the key goals that they'll be doing is looking for the objects in space that pose a threat to life on Earth. Asteroids and comets that could hit us in the years or the decades to come. And these satellites that are being put up make it harder to find those things. So there's a very real, albeit very low, likelihood, possibility that these satellites could lead to the end of life on Earth in a really hyperbolic sense because we fail to discover the thing that poses a threat. Just explain to me, because I was under the impression that SpaceX was... Um, the rocket ship that he's using to launch people into space, but you're saying that he's putting a whole heap of satellites up there. Is that correct? That's correct. So SpaceX is a company that does a great many things. Starlink is an endeavour to launch a very large number of satellites into low Earth orbit, 500 k's above the ground, to provide high-speed internet and broadband to places in the regions that don't have access to it normally. And a lot of publicity has been put out about we're doing this to democratise the access to the internet and to ensure that people in impoverished countries without infrastructure can get this. And some of that may be true, but some of it's a little bit disingenuous because people in impoverished countries, and I think Elon Musk even said at some point people in the Amazon, are not going to be able to afford $1,000 install cost and $200 a month for the regio. Um, So it's clearly, and understandably for a company, an endeavour to make them money by providing a service. The problem is that they can do whatever they want. They can put things up there. And to give them the credit, they have been trying to work with astronomers to mitigate the impacts of this, which some of the other companies who are looking at doing this are not. It's just they're getting all of the flack and all of the publicity because they're first, and they're the biggest and most obvious at the moment. And did you say they're going to put 42,000? The goal is for their working network to have 42,000 satellites in at any given time. Now, one of the other concerns that's come up about this, which has surprised me but makes a lot of sense, is that people are now seriously looking at the potential damage that could be done to the Earth's atmosphere and our environment by these satellites as they re-enter, because anything at that low an altitude will eventually fall back to Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. And that's actually built into the design, because when these things fail, you need to get rid of them. Otherwise, you have the risk of them colliding with each other and making more debris and getting this runaway Kessler syndrome of death and destruction and doom that anybody who's seen gravity is so familiar with. So these things fall back to Earth, they burn up in the atmosphere. And again, back in the day, people didn't think anything of this because a few spacecraft re-entering per year and burning up isn't a problem when we get 400 tonnes of space material falling onto the Earth in a busy day, somewhere between five and 400 tonnes, depending on what time of year you're at. So back in the early days, the amount of material we were burning up in the atmosphere was trivial compared to what was coming in naturally. When you get to this stage, they're comparable or greater than the amount of natural material falling in. So there's suddenly questions happening about what happens when you take three tonnes of aluminium and other metals and rare earths and dump them into the Earth's atmosphere and do that repeatedly time and time again. Because as we saw in the 1980s, putting things in the atmosphere without fully understanding what happened can have catastrophic effects. We had the ozone layer getting degraded. And when we realise the challenge, humanity pulled together and stopped that. It's a remarkable achievement and we forget about it now because we did it. Mm. But there are people starting to raise concerns, not because this will definitely be a bad thing, but simply because we've not studied it so we don't know. And so it's important to get to grips with it. 
Well, I guess my um, question was much sort of um, on a more superficial level, and it was because I was thinking with the if you pay enough money you can now um go into space can't you the space tourism thing yeah Yeah. and would you do it um not quite yet um a i could think of a lot better ways to spend that money if someone was kind enough to give me it there are other things i'd want to do first but you know fundamentally if you could get me to space and guarantee it being safe then definitely but i think everybody has their own personal calculation of the risk they're willing to wear and there are those who are more adventurous and those who are less so The space shuttle had two famous catastrophes and that ended up bringing an end to the space shuttle. But when it was first launched in the late 1970s, it was a test vehicle. It was only meant to fly a handful of flights before they released a better version. And in the engineering documents before it ever flew, it said the risk of something going wrong with this is about 2%. So everybody who flew on the space shuttle had a great amount of courage because they were aware of the fact that there was a one in 50 chance that they would not come home based on those documents. And in fact, it turned out that in just over 100 flights, there were two catastrophes. So the numbers were pretty much bang on the money. Everybody has their own perception of risk. And to me, at the moment, still going into space is a little bit more risky than I'd want to wear just as a thing to do on holiday. You know, that said, I'm happy to go skiing, but I probably wouldn't want to bungee jump. You know, we've all got our own level of (laughs) exactly where that falls. And to me, being a space tourist at the minute is more akin to bungee jumping than skiing. (laughs) Put it that way. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I am running out of time. But, Jonty, what happens to you when you um, go to a party and you say to someone that you're an astronomer and they say, oh, yes, and I'm a Pisces? Does that happen very often? I, I've had that many, many times. And half of the time they're doing it deliberately to wind me up as a bit ah. of a joke because isn't it funny? Mm. And there, there's all those jokes that everybody thinks they're the first person They're the to first think person who's ever um, said it. And sometimes it's a genuine misunderstanding. And when I was a kid... Um, I got very annoyed by this and it's got very, very passionate about arguing against astrology and all of that side of things. Nowadays, it, it doesn't really bother me so much. I'm happy to just have a chat with people and explain to them in very gentle and compassionate language the error of their ways, okay. um, teach them that. But it's one of the things I found interesting at uni was you get a very different reaction from people depending on how you couch that. If I say I'm an astronomer or I'm an astrobiologist, that's a kind of wow moment. If I say I'm an astrophysicist, less of a wow moment. And if I say that I'm... When I was doing my PhD, I'd say I'm an astronomer, but if it was someone I really wasn't that excited at talking about, I'd say, oh yeah, I'm working in the Department of Theoretical Physics. And it's amazing how quickly they turn around and walk the other way. Don't have the second question to that one. (laughs) Now, I didn't get to ask you about um, red dwarfs and brown dwarfs and white holes and um, about um, Dr Fabian Zander out there at USQ. I am up to the stage where I'm just going to have to ask you um, who is your favourite royal jaunty? This person doesn't need to be living and they don't need to be British. And that's a really difficult one for me because I'm from the north of England and from a background where very much the desire would be to see the royal family retired and put in a semi-detached house with a livable wage and forgotten about. Um, I, I twist it slightly and say one of the good things that the royal family in the UK has done over many generations is to have the position of astronomer royal. And that is not a royal who is an astronomer, but it's rather an eminent astronomer of the time who's recognised and given this position that gives them great opportunity as a communicator, but also becomes the advisor to the royal family. And there's been many, many eminent people in that place, but the person I'm pointing to is the second astronomer royal, Edmund Helley, or Sir Edmund Helley, because obviously as astronomer royal, you have to have a night at. Keeps your ears warm when you're in bed. Um, so Edmund Helley was this fabulous astronomer who was close friends with Sir Isaac Newton, who was a great scientist and also a master of the mint and, and also a person who was trying to change metals into other things, an alchemist, many different things. But in the 1680s, Isaac Newton released his Principia Mathematica, which is his mathematical toolbox to understand the universe. And Edmund Halley took that and realised that this very bright comet he'd seen a few years earlier was the same as one that had been seen 76 years before, 176 years before that. And he used the tools that Newton had developed to predict its next apparition. And this was that the comet should come back in 1758. And it was eventually recovered by Johann Georg Palitsch, who was this German farmer and amateur astronomer. And that was the proof that comets come back. And it was something fundamental to our understanding of the solar system today. So bending the question quite severely, (laughs) he'd probably be the favourite in terms of someone linked to royalty. Well, I think that's a perfect answer for you, John T. I couldn't, I couldn't think of a better answer. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. And my very last question, I'm not sure whether you're a dancing man, but 
If you were to be somewhere where you could dancing, what's a song that couldn't keep you off the dance floor? See, the challenge I have with this is that I tend to sing rather than dance. I was always a person who, when people tried to drag me clubbing when I was an undergrad, would stand there kind of feeling very out of place on a dance floor and just sing my heart out instead. But I probably, if I had the ultimate control, would bring on something by a symphonic metal group called Nightwish, who are not as scary as they sound. It's a type of music that people in Australia are not that familiar with. And probably the go to there is just a first track, would probably be Ghost Love Score, which is about ten and a half minutes long and is... Yeah, well, if, you, if you're going to get to pick one song to have on the dance floor, you pick something that's long, so you get the benefit of the value. I mean, there's one of the other tracks I pick is 28 minutes, but that's pushing it a little bit. But this is like ten and a half minutes of kind of rock cross with opera that's very moving, very emotional. It's the kind of thing that is a bit different. And yeah, that certainly get me humming along, if not dancing. If blood. not singing. Well, Jonty, with that, I'm going to thank you for being my guest today on Big Little Small Talk. It's been sometimes above my, uh, often <laughs> above my head, way above my head, but fascinating nonetheless. And I've really enjoyed our chat today. So thank you for being my guest. That's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much thank for having me. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.